Shattering Glass, Chapter 25 Coop was a terrific athlete. He had a future, that one. It was like somebody gut shot me when I saw the damage done to that kid's body. I was there when the doc told Coop he'd have to have an artificial knee. Coop knew that football and college was a thing of his past. I admit I didn't keep up with him much. I knew he went to junior college here. He could have knocked me down with a feather when he came by asking for a reference. His face isn't the same. Even with the plastic surgery, when he smiles, he looks a little lopsided. It makes him look older, but not old. He'd finished school and had an interview coming up to teach fourth grade. Coach Larry Gavin. Friday, February 8th, Coop signed on the dotted line. Coach Gavin had a ceremony in his office. Coop stood between Coach and the TCU rep. Local sports reporters recorded the occasion. Simon pulled in a 21 on the test. The computer hadn't flagged his score, and Coop's future seemed assured. Bobster, Rob, Simon, and I were allowed to witness the signing. We clapped and cheered as Coop shook hands with the rep and grabbed Coach Gavin in a bear hug. He thanked Coach about ten times as he hammered the poor guy on the back. He bolted over to us, waving the pen. They let me keep the pen I signed with, he said. Coop, it costs about 29 cents, Bobster said. Wrong, Bob. This is a magic pen. Yeah, Bob, that pen is worth four free years at TCU, Rob said as he beamed at Coop. Congrats. You deserve it. Coop nodded to Simon. Couldn't have done it without the glass, man. Simon thrust a stack of papers at Coop. For you, big guy. Coop took the papers and read the top sheet. He shook his head. You're too much, Simon. Hand them out to whoever you want. I'll make more if you need them. Thanks. Guess I should start right away. Guess I should start right here. He shoved a paper at each of us. It was a flyer with, it's a party, marching across a banner. Underneath the cartoon depicted Coop wearing a crown. Next to that was a frog, a crown hanging crookedly from horns sprouting from its head. The caption read, this time the prince becomes a frog. Below was an invitation to celebrate with Coop at a party Saturday afternoon. It offered burgers and beer from 2 p.m. until 2 a.m. at the home of Simon Glass. Great idea, Glass, Bobster said. And it sure doesn't hurt your chances for class favorite, does it? I added. Rob turned to me. Actually, it was my idea, Young. It will get Simon some votes, sure, but you don't have to ruin it for Coop. He paused. Or me. I glanced up and saw Coop posing for the sports photojournalist. Coop was flying high, released from the cage he had been born into. You're right, Rob. I'm shutting up. Coop waved Simon over and showed him the signed agreement and handed the coach and the rep one of the flyers for his party. Coach read it and laughed. I'll be glad to be there, Coop, but I'll call first so you can hide the beer. I dressed carefully for the party, even washing my hair twice, trying to get that casual, tussled look. I got there just after two and the place was already crowded and cranked up. I saw Coop outside, shoveling a hamburger patty from the grill onto Coach Gavin's plate. No beer was in sight. Simon guided partygoers around a long table piled with burger fixings, beans, chips, and a huge cake decorated in TCU's colors of blue, white, and gray. Blue letters proclaimed, to make him a frog, you gotta kiss the prince. Sarah Branston and Amy Lawson pointed at the cake, giggled, and rushed to plant wet ones on Coop's cheeks. Bobster waved me over. Can you believe this shit? He talked his parents into going out of town for the weekend, and Glass got the housekeeper to come in today and again tomorrow to clean up. Does he have the life or what? I've met his parents, I said. I'll take the or what. Bobster looked perplexed, but his deep thought fled as he caught sight of Ginger Donaldson. See ya, buddy. He dodged through the crowd, shouting, Back, girls, don't fight. One at a time, one at a time. He was a reasonable facsimile of his old self. Coach Gavin had finished his burger and was saying goodbye, shaking hands with members of his football team. The kegs were wheeled in as his car pulled out. The party pumped up the volume and the crowd brought out my post rana fun phobia. I flashed a high sign to Coop, pushed my way into the kitchen, scooted around the corner and into Simon's study. I stepped in with my back to the interior of the dim, quiet room, pulling the door shut. 
When I returned, I saw her curled up at one end of the sofa. Rana? I whispered. What's a guy like you doing in a place like this? I noticed that she didn't say nice guy. Just lucky, I guess. She gave a barely perceptible nod. Mind if I stay? I asked. Looking to her left, she stretched out her hand and twisted a plastic rod. The mini blinds opened slightly, allowing slats of light to dart across the shadows. Why not? She said, almost to herself. I sat down, uncomfortable and tense. I couldn't find a place for my hands, which had become huge and cumbersome, as if encased in boxing gloves. I sighed. I've taken a driving past your house just to watch the light in your window. I know. My tongue turned to sand. You saw me? No, the neighbors did. They took the number off your license plates and called Dad. Not only did Rana know the pathetically desperate lengths to which I'd gone, her parents and neighbors did, too. I knew now how Dallas Alice, Lance, and even Simon felt to be an object of derision. There's not much I can say, I finally croaked. We sat in silence, not looking at each other. I watched the dust motes dancing in the filtered beams. When she spoke, it startled me. It doesn't change anything, but I miss you too. She said it like she was ashamed, and something inside me broke apart and splintered. There's no going back, is there, Ron? She rubbed her fists at her eyes like a sad child. I wish I wouldn't cry all the time, she said. I sat next to her and slid my arm around her shoulders. She leaned against me, snugging her face into my neck, knowing with a resigned certainty that Rana was only seeking a temporary safe harbor. I did no more than stroke her cheek with my fingertips. She sighed and pulled away, rubbing her temples with the heels of her hands. My head is smart, but my heart is stupid. Her words drifted in the silence. And you'll listen to your head. Yeah, she murmured. I've done a lot of thinking. A lot of talking with dad. I've even seen a shrink a few times. I didn't know what to do with this. There's just something, she trailed off, missing in you. And I think it's something that will get more and more important. What is it? She touched my lips with trembling fingers. You're everybody's idea of a good guy, but you're not good because of any convictions or moral compass. You're good because you don't say no. You do as you're told, and so far, nobody told you to do anything wrong. She pulled her fingers away. But someday, someone will. I stood and paced. I needed to pound the pillow in my room. Ron, grow up. Everybody keeps telling me that I'm a sheep. Look in the mirror. Are you wearing comfortable pajamas at this party? No. Why? Because the magazines and other people tell you what to wear. Rana turned her face to the window. I paced again. Bob doesn't buy a pair of sunglasses unless the hunk of the month is wearing them. Radio talk shows are a dime a dozen because people call in so somebody else will tell them what to do. Movies tell us how skinny to be and television tells us which toilet paper to wipe our ass with. And everybody listens. You're even listening to your shrink instead of your heart. I stopped, my anger ebbing to a plea. Why do you have to make me the sinner because I follow instead of lead? I wound down flashed and burned. I sank down next to her, my elbows on my knees, my head in my hands. I cried. Right in front of her, I cried. Rana said nothing and didn't move. When I finished and wiped my eyes with the back of my fist, she turned toward me. Leaning forward, she kissed me, a kiss as delicate and fragile as a soap bubble. I have to leave, she said. Wait. I placed my hands on each side of her face and stared into her eyes, memorizing. Bars of light broke, it, broke her face into bands of sun and shadow. I let her go.